Our next session um, is going to be on neuroscience and cognitive perspectives on compassion. Our moderator today is Gail de Bordes with Emiliana, who you know, Stephanie, and uh, Cliff. So without further ado, we'll begin. And again, thank you for being here today. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about um, neuroscience and cognitive perspectives on compassion. So um, I just want to say again, like thank you so much for the, f to the organizers for having this wonderful meeting. This uh, morning session was especially interesting because it really set the stage of different ways to think about this, a few of the inter interventions that exist to cultivate compassion. And so um, uh, what I'm going to present this afternoon and then uh, what the other panelists are going to present will show you where the, the neuroscience perspective is at. And let me just start by saying it's, it hasn't gone very far yet. Okay, so please keep that in mind because we're going to be describing a number of studies and, and results and it's all very much provisional at this point because as we've heard this morning, we don't really even know what compassion versus empathy is. And, you know, it's already difficult to set these uh, definitions. So it's even harder to try to find how they work in our brains. And so I just want to make sure that it's clear for everyone. We're not trying to measure compassion in the brain at this stage. We're trying to see how in some experimental conditions that we think have something to do with compassion or empathy, what happens in the brain, what are the different mechanisms, but, you know, so big, big caveat here. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, a little bit about my own background. Uh, I am a neuroscientist by training. Uh, I did my undergraduate in engineering and then a PhD in neuroscience and actually in computational neuroscience at BU. So I come from a more like, um, you know, like hardcore <laughs> view of the brain, which was like, plunging electrodes in animals' brains, measuring that, building mathematical models of how that works. So then when I switched to human brain imaging in 2009, I realized that this was a different <laughs> animal altogether, that it's very much not as um, advanced and just because it's so recent. So I think the field has tremendous um, <coughs> potential uh, to teach us a lot about our brains, which especially in these topics, cannot be studied in animals. So I think this is great, but it's also very new. So the field is, you know, brain imaging in humans is like maybe 10 or 15 years old, really. And the study of compassion and empathy is even younger than that, like less than 10 years, maybe just five years. So just keep in mind that this is all very much like uh, Cliff was saying this morning, like a lab meeting that we're sharing where we're at right now, but this is not final knowledge by any means. Um, so I'm going to describe some... Uh, can you bring this on? Uh, some of the recent work that has been done uh, in the main groups that have been studying empathy and compassion, and sometimes you know, the definitions of these may or may not match with what we, see, we saw this morning. So I'm going to start with um, a great review paper. So if, if you guys are interested in this topic, I strongly urge you to actually read this paper. Uh, from 2012 by uh, Bernard and Tanya Singer. Tanya Singer is uh, arguably the world expert in empathy and its studies uh, with brain imaging. And uh, so they go over a few of the stuff that has been done with empathy. So again, not necessarily compassion. In this case, it may be more just uh, how reactive we are to seeing somebody else in pain. And um, uh, it may not be you know, good or anything. So it bear, you know, keep that in mind. It's just really uh, empathy for pain in this case. So uh, two main regions that have been involved in these studies are the anterior insula and the anterior middle cingulate cortex. Uh, that's based on uh, a meta-analysis of previous studies. So these are two uh, major regions that we now think have a lot to do with empathy, but keep in mind they also have been involved with many other things, uh, decision-making, uh, I don't know, like so many other uh, put, uh, experimental conditions. So they, they're not markers of empathy or compassion by any means. It's just that they happen to be activated in this case. And uh, in this review, they highlight that uh, when studying uh, empathy, people have tried to use two different types of paradigms. One in which um, uh, the elicitation of empathy was cue-based. 
So they showed a cue on the screen to people who were inside the scanner. And it was a symbolic representation of what they would be told was happening to another person. So in this case, they were told, uh, if you see uh, this uh, arrow pointing to the side and it's colored in blue, it means this other person is going to receive a small amount of pain. And if it's in dark blue, it's gonna re this person is going to receive a higher amount of pain. Whereas if uh, the arrow is pointing down, it means you're going to receive uh, this pain, you know, low if it's in pink or high if it's, if it's red. So it's, it's not showing you the suffering directly. It's just indicating uh, you that this is what's going to happen. And then, um, so the other way to do this is to actually show pictures of suffering. So in this case, for example, uh, they have this, uh, this whole database of images. I don't know if you can see very well, but uh, in the top, there's two images that are almost similar, except in one of them, the, the hand is receiving pain. It's the one on the right, because there's, a, I think, a syringe that's, uh, or like a needle that's coming into it or something. Whereas in the no pain image that corresponds to it, uh, the needle just uh, is in between fingers, so it's not actually touching the hand. Um, and then, um, so you, you imagine that this can be either done to yourself or to another person when you're shown these images. So that's how people have tried to manipulate empathy while doing brain imaging in the scanner. Okay. And so what they, they report in this review is that um, you actually find different brain regions activating in these two different types of experiments. So if you do Q-based, it's a bit more abstract. So it's going to engage brain regions that uh, have previously been involved with theory of mind and mentalizing. So things that we've talked about a little bit this morning, which is to take somebody else's perspective, but from a purely cognitive fashion. So you may not actually feel their pain on an affective level, but you're just thinking about it and understanding their perspective. Whereas um, in picture-based experiments, it tended to um, activate regions of the brain involved with pain when you actually receive it. So it would be the same areas that would activate when you see someone else in pain uh, through this type of paradigm versus when you actually receive pain, uh, like really, like when you actually are being pricked, you know, while you're being scanned or well, there's different ways to induce pain in the scanner. You can uh, put a little bit of heat on the skin. There's different ways. And so uh, in this case, uh, again, like the the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate areas tend to light up. So, um, yeah, so this just shows you uh, what these regions are. So in the case of Q-based experiments, uh, the, the network that I was talking about that uh, has been previously involved with mentalizing involves, uh, includes areas such as ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex, uh, area TPJ, which is temporal parietal junction, and also uh, some other areas. Uh, so uh, this is what happens when you show Q-based um, designs to elicit empathy. And with picture-based, instead, uh, you see activation in the anterior insula um, and other parts uh, of the brain that we think have to do with the mirror uh, neuron network. So just to step back a little bit, the mirror neuron network uh, is, uh, I think we talked about it this morning with the, the ice cream and the monkey, right? So uh, it's a set of network of neurons that were found in monkeys that uh, light up when the monkey sees someone perform a specific uh, motor action. And uh, goal-directed motor Right. Thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's like really, it's, it's thought that this also is engaged when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So this idea of uh, exchanging your perspective with that of the other person. Um, so these uh, mirror neurons happen to be in, uh, in these regions of the monkey brain. Now we don't know for sure if we have the same types of neurons in humans. It's just the best guess we have for now. But so that's why this is called the mirror neural network in human, but it's, you know, again, kind of, it hasn't been completely determined yet that this is the case. So, um, interestingly, uh, there's differences across people in how much 
these areas get activated depending on a number of things, uh, which can be their own personality traits, but also how you manipulate the experiment or other, um, other uh, variables. So for example, um, in these studies of empathy for pain, when the insula gets activated, the amount of activation in the insula is actually modulated by individual traits such as alexithymia, which is the ability to be uh, aware of one's own uh, uh, feelings in the body, like uh, body awareness, basically, such, uh, such that people who have low um, levels of awareness, which is high alexithymia, have less activation in the insula. And this is true in this case, both in control healthy subjects, shown in black, and in people on the autism spectrum. Um, so um, there seems to be something about the fact that how you were able to be in touch with your own feelings has something to do with how the insula is activated during empathy, which again may or may not mean you have more or less empathy, but so that's, <laughs> that's, that's what we can see at least now. Uh, and also the amount of uh, brain activation in these empathy experiments can be modulated by um, for which other person people imagine that there was pain uh, delivered or given to them. And in, a, in an interesting study that Tanya Singer did uh, in 2006, they actually manipulated the setting such that the subjects would first play a game with um, other people and these people were actually confederates that would either play the game fairly or unfairly. So they did that and then after that they put the subjects in the scanner and had this empathy for pain experiment telling them pain is going to be delivered to this person you just played the game with. And they found that depending on this player uh, being fair or unfair, people had more or less levels of activation uh, in the anterior insula. Uh, such that, uh, as you can see here, there was a higher uh, activation in the insula in the case of the fair player than in the case of the unfair player. So uh, that goes back to what we saw this morning, that of course uh, we usually have different levels of, of empathy and capacity to be compassionate to others depending on our perception of them. So in this case, it was all about just having played one game with this person and already having some kind of uh, of model of them as being a good person or a bad person potentially and that affecting how the brain responds to seeing them suffering. Um, then um, they, so they found this in the anterior insula <coughs> but interestingly enough they also found a result in uh, the nucleus accumbens which is part of the reward system and in this case um, they found a difference across genders actually that um, when pain was delivered to the unfair player, uh, women had uh, a decreased activation in this area, the nucleus accumbens, whereas men had an increased response. And they found that this, uh, this was actually correlated with their reported desire for revenge uh, because they had been playing with this player who was unfair and so they were experiencing something about you know getting revenge for that and so seeing this person receiving pain actually activated the reward area nucleus accumbens uh in that case is there a burning question there or okay so yeah was a significant difference in the empathy activate in some activation yes um for unfair players that's a significant difference? I think, yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I don't I remember. Uh, I think it's it is, but it was in women as well, I believe. But they both show they women. Both show a decrease. Decrease. The they show a decrease, decrease a but the yeah. men decrease a lot more. Yeah, so I don't know if that, if the, the gender difference was significant or not. I but but you can see here that it, it's, it's a large effect, whether it's statistically significant or not. I think it is. Uh, yeah. She's talked about it. Okay. So yeah, that's a yet another, I'm not going to go there, but there's this gender <laughs> question. Um, okay, and then, uh, so they replicated these results with a more uh, general experiment. Instead of just having people play and then the player being fair or unfair, they manipulated uh, feelings of in-group or out-group membership. And they found essentially the same thing, 
that there was less activation in the interinsula when somebody from your out group suffered versus somebody from your in group. And um, that was correlated with self report measures of out group impression, uh, whether you think this out group is, is good or bad, basically, if you have a positive or negative view of them. And, uh, and there was also um, a correlation with um, the people's self reported um, willingness to help this other person, depending on their group membership. Um, and then, uh, same thing in nucleus accumbens, the, the area associated with the reward system. Again, a correlation between how much uh, activation there was. So, uh, in this case, uh, if you had a really negative impression of this outgroup, the nucleus accumbens was more activated when you saw this person suffering, as if that was a rewarding thing to see, maybe. And uh, it was negative to correlate with your w desire to help them. Now, I'm going to talk about an interesting study that goes along the same direction. Uh, the title is a little cutesy, but it's actually a, a good study, I think. It's called uh, Love Hurts, an fMRI study. But it's really about empathy for pain for um, three different categories of people. Uh, yourself, a loved one, and in that case, I think it was a romantic partner, and a stranger. And it was the same kind of design. Like you show, They showed images of... Um, uh, like hands and feet receiving different painful stimuli and people had to imagine this is done to me or this is done to my loved one or this is done to a stranger. And again, there was a uh, different brain activation in these cases with more activation for self and the loved one and less activation for the stranger in this case also in the uh, um, anterior insula and anterior cigarette. And, um, and that you can even see that in um, just the levels of activation in these areas and also in the TPJ. So both in areas involved with mentalizing and uh, areas with more the affective aspect of, of, uh, of empathy. Now, um, as Brooke mentioned this morning, there's been some um, uh, fMRI studies of compassion interventions, in particular in this case, CBCT. And this is a study that was done at Emory University by Jenny Mascaro and colleagues. And they looked at the effects of this eight-week CBCT training on how people performed in an empathy uh, task, which uh, I think you showed, and, um, and also how uh, brain activation was correlated with that. So just briefly, this is a study that is still ongoing, but uh, some of these subjects have already been scanned through it. So it's called the Compassion Attention Longitudinal Meditation Study. Uh, with healthy subjects 25 to 55 years old, this eight-week intervention, which was either CBCT or a training in just mindful attention. So the same thing they did for the first week, except that they did that for uh, eight weeks, pretty much. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but just to simplify. And then a third active control where people uh, basically went to health-related uh, lectures. And um, they had to meditate 20 to 30 minutes a day, and so uh, in this study, they looked only at people from the CBCT group or the control group. And so they had this task, uh, reading the mind in the eyes test that you mentioned, and uh, they found that after the training, uh, people from the CBCT group in blue ha had higher scores at this task, so they were getting better at it, whereas the controls actually got worse. Uh, so getting worse in this case doesn't necessarily mean that they forgot how to be uh, empathic, but just that the task is a little repetitive and boring and they may have just lost motivation to really engage with it, uh, whereas that didn't happen in the uh, compassion group. But interestingly, uh, these uh, scores uh, on, the, on this task were correlated with activation, again, in brain regions that are part of this system uh, of uh, theory of mind in this case. So, uh, shown here, three different regions of interest, uh, the inferior frontal gyrus, um, over there, the left one, uh, and the spiritual sulcus, and also dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. So in all these regions, uh, for both groups, there was a correlation between the level of activation in the brain during this task and people's uh, uh, performance at the task. Uh, and, and this shows the pre to post uh, difference, meaning uh, the difference between how they did it after the eight-week intervention compared to before. 
So again, this suggests that the training is doing something to the brain. People get better at this task. There's some interesting things happening in brain areas that make sense because it's related with theory of mind. So uh, that's, that was that. And then uh, finally, I want to present briefly a study from Tanya Singer's group uh, that was very recently published, uh, looking at, uh, again, like brain activation after some short amount of uh, compassion training, which I will describe. Uh, but uh, what they use is a slightly different task. They use what they call social effective video task. So it goes like this. Uh, people would just wait for six seconds. Then they watch a 10 to 18 second video that's either neutral, just people doing ordinary stuff, or emotionally negatively valenced, so it's people suffering through different conditions. And then they ask people to rate the videos in terms of how much empathy it made them feel, whether uh, how much negative affect and how much positive affect. And at the same time, uh, recording brain activation. So uh, first of all, they had, so they had these two different videos, what they call low emotion and high emotion. And in this case, it means high negative emotion. So people rated before any training that they experienced more empathy in the case of watching the high uh, emotion video as expected. And interestingly, uh, again, in these areas, the anterior insula and the anterior middle cingulate cortex, there was actually a correlation, like how much activation was measured in these areas was directly correlated with people's self-reported uh, levels of empathy after watching these videos. And then they had people go through a training. So in this case, there were 18 to 35 year old, all females in this case, just keep that in mind. And the training was only one day. It was a six hour long retreat type format in which they learned uh, loving kindness meditation. And then after that, they could practice at home for a few days. They come back to the lab. So they did a little bit more group practices, but really not, not many days. And then they were scanned uh, after that, so a few days later. Um, and um, there was a control group that did some memory training. And so they found that um, when watching these uh, videos, um, there were uh, different ratings, first of all, like people self-reported ratings of these videos changed in the compassion group. Uh, such that uh, they felt more positive emotions. Even when watching the negative, or like the, the high emotion negative videos, uh, and uh, their negative emotion reports did not change, and their empathy rating also increased in the case of the, uh, the people who did the compassion training, and there was no change in the control group. And then looking at the brain, they found uh, this time uh, actually, no changes in the, the original regions of interest, the interinsula, interstingulate, and uh, regions from the theory of mind uh, network, but instead they found something different, which is there was increased activation in several brain areas that are part of the reward system. And again, even when people were watching these negative videos, these videos of people suffering. So, um, Kind of interesting, especially given that there was a link with the self-report effect, that people reported that they had more positive effect, and then these regions became more activated. So um, again, uh, uh, we don't know yet, I think, how to interpret that necessarily. Uh, they offer a possibility that um, compassion feels good, or loving kindness is something that feels good. So even if you see someone suffering, there's this warmth that you feel for them, that's actually a positive feeling. Um, I think this is controversial, like was mentioned this morning. There's also potentially a negative feeling aspect to experiencing compassion. So I don't know what happened here, the fact that their negative affect did not change and that there was no change in, in activation of the, the, the empathy related brain region. So the question remains open, but just to show you in this brief overview that uh, you know we still have a lot of work to do to figure out uh, how these things work and um, what they do to the brain. So I'm going to finish here and then turn it to um, Emiliana, okay. who's going to give us uh, other perspectives on this. If there's any burning questions, thank you. All right, so while we're setting up, I'm going to do the like South America version of this. <laughs> and I'll flesh that out. Um, my husband and I took our honeymoon in South America and a nice person who lived where we were in Chile said, well, where are you from? And my husband said, America. And he said, this is America. 
<laughs> and I said, he's right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and what I mean by that is neuroscience, often people think, oh, that just means the brain. And actually, I'm part of that party. I, I, my training is in cognitive neuroscience, and I've spent many, many, many years thinking just about the brain and, and how interesting and important it is. But in fact, neuroscience also includes this whole other aspect, right? The peripheral nervous system, the rest of our body. And um, there are deep and rich and uh, feed forward feedback interconnections between our bodily systems and our brain that are very important and relevant in this study of compassion. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more broad strokes than Gael was, um, just for the sake of time and um, lack of expertise. <laughs> but know that I'm deeply interested, and if anybody wants to talk more about how we can both learn more about these other areas of studying compassion, uh, looking at uh, the body, um, please engage me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the genetic research that's been done that is relevant to compassion. Please don't walk out of here thinking that we have some idea of what a compassionate gene is. Okay? I have already tried to convince you that compassion has lots of different sort of components to it, different parts, different processes. When we try to think about a genetic sort of correlate, it's maybe some consequence of being a compassionate person is associated with uh, a certain genetic um, uh, style or, or attribution, or maybe a certain lifestyle that is more likely if you are not compassionate, say perhaps being very lonely is associated with a certain way that genes will express during the lifetime. So that's the kind of uh, level I'll be talking about. We'll talk a little bit about a structure called the vagus nerve and its influence on the body, in particular the heart, and how that's been implicated in research on sort of general pro-social orientation, you know, being interested in the welfare of others. Uh, not specifically about compassion, but compassion fits in the sort of team of players. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the, um, the sort of stress system because, and, and I think that I'll leave a, a, a lot of that discussion to Stephanie um, because she has more expertise in the relationship between stress functioning or stress physiology and sort of nurture, nurturance care physiology and how these systems, because of, again, what she brought up earlier, the fact that we're a limited resource system, right? Our bodies make choices. They make choices about where the glucose gets to go. Where does the oxygen get to go based on the situation in front of us and the way that we interpret that. So given, given multiple demands, sometimes the stress physiology wins, hopefully not too often. Um, so I'll start out with one of my uh, really good friends from graduate school, Serena Rodriguez, who's now is a professor. Uh, she's still at University of Oregon, and she moved to Oregon oh, at Health and Medical Sciences. Anyway, she's in Oregon, um, and she did a wonderful study where she collected, you know, cheek swabs from a lot of people, and she looked at a little piece of a gene that was sort of labeled here RS53576, which is involved in oxytocin functioning. Okay. Um, what did she find? Uh, it, everyone in this room, if we did the cheek swab, we would figure out you would either have an AA configuration, an AG configuration, or a GG configuration. On average, when they looked at those three different types of people, um, the people with the with the GG configuration tended to be more successful at that mind, reading the mind and the eyes task. So um, get pictures of here and say what emotion people are, are, are expressing. They tended to be more cooperative, more inclined to be generous in a sort of neuroeconomics task where they're asked, given $10 and asked to split it with a person they don't know. They tended to be more on the side of five to five versus I'll keep eight, they'll keep two because they don't know the difference, right? Um, and, and uh, this, this research was done several years ago. So since then, there have been more studies that implicate uh, this, this sort of genetic um, affordance with aspects of pro-social behavior, with styles of parenting, being a more affectionate, less punishing parent, um, with your uh, capacity to be empathic, your general positive affective tone. Okay, so again, oxytocin is not the cure-all, end-all, right? It is involved in many things, but it's probably richly involved in processes that make it more likely that we'll experience compassion. Social auditory processing, what does that mean? Well, understanding the tone of someone's 
meaning, right? What, what it means when somebody uses a certain intonation when they're speaking. Um, one's interest in reaching out to others when they need help, right? So that should remind you of sort of loneliness. So um, yeah, is there a pro-social genotype? Will we be able to figure out that you're a kinder, more social person just by looking at your genes, or particularly this oxytocin snip? No, okay. If, is there a likelihood that oxytocin in combination perhaps with a dopamine system, in combination with a serotonin system, right? There's probably a sort of medley of genetic properties that together might make you more inclined to experience the world uh, with greater capacity for compassion. But this is, this is what we're loving <laughs> you for perhaps pushing forward, right? This is the kind of uh, fun work that I hope can get done. Um, the next sort of fun work that I like, that I'm a big fan of, is done by Steve Cole at UCLA. He's also the faculty, I don't know, director of an organization called Hope Lab in Palo Alto, where they try to make products that make people's lives better. Um, he looks at gene expression. Okay, so when I was in college, we had a whole class dedicated to nature versus nurture. These are the things that are defined by nature, and these are the things that are defined by nurture. Okay, that should tell you a little bit about how old I am. But um, obviously it's not that way, right? We know there's this rich, deeply interconnected process where we come with a certain genetic sort of affordance, but what happens to us in our life not only shapes things that are hypothetically not genetically determined, but prompts our genetic, our genes to express in a way that is suitable for that particular context. So what Steve Cole was interested in was loneliness. Okay, so he, and loneliness, again, we're looking at sort of constructs that are related to one's capacity for compassion. You can imagine that somebody who's not well versed in expressing compassion or receiving compassion in their life is probably gonna fall into the category of being lonely, right? They don't have good connections with people. They're not being vulnerable. They're not accepting help or social support. What he found was that when people who are older, he took an older population in Los Angeles, um, if you look at their, their immune profiles as a consequence of the cell, of the genes that they know sort of drive immune responding, stress and immune responding, they show a pattern of hyperinflammation that is not healthy as a consequence of being lonely, which is a result of their gene expression. Right? So they're expressing in a way that is not healthy as a consequence of being lonely, which we could imagine is associated with their capacity for compassion, their relationship to compassion. So can being a more compassionate person make you, ex your genes express in a way that gives you a healthier immune profile? I think that's the suggestion. And this is a, a finding, actually this is sort of, this isn't describing what I just said, but this is the next study they did. So they took lonely people and they taught them MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a loved cousin of compassion training in many ways, if, if not the sort of founding This is a medley of practices that yeah. are a loved cousin. Exactly. These are bumper stickers. There you go. So, um, and what they were able to show was that MBSR training, which this is a little bit of that discussion about which practice, which training is best, who's, who's works more, who's does what. If you were to ask John Kabat-Zinn, who is the founding mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction person, if compassion was unique and distinct from mindfulness, he would say no. Right? His, his thesis is that mindfulness, as it's really you know, floridly understood, is a rich and deep state which is fundamentally compassionate. So. It's, it's, not, it's not unreasonable to, to suspect that people who, who do experience MBSR also experience uh, heightened compassion. So people who did MBSR showed a shift in their, um, one, experienced perceived loneliness, and two, their uh, genetically expressed uh, immune profile. So these are fun little sort of cutting edge ways to look at how compassion could affect the body. Now I'm going to... Um, 
sort of abruptly shift over to oxytocin. We've talked about it a little bit already. Um, there's this fun hipster science of squirting it in the nose and seeing what happens. It makes people, without thinking really deeply, it makes people trust each other more, it makes people more generous. But then if you get people from rival football teams in Germany, they hate each other more after the oxytocin. So there's this clear sort of parochial dimension to it. Is that flexible? I don't know. I don't know. But I do want to harken back to the sort of pioneering oxytocin research, which was on the prairie voles, right? What was the difference? It wasn't that some prairie voles were really nice and compassionate and others were not, right? If you know the study, one, there was a species of little mouse rat organisms. Sorry, I'm not a great <laughs> zoologist. <laughs> and some of them were incredibly monogamous and the others were very polygamous. And that's what was the difference. So it's about trust and monogamy and long-term bonds. That was the story, but it kind of got broadened out to it's about love and kindness and everything, but really, for monogamy, there's, you know, monogamy is pretty parochial, right? You're not, you know, be, you're not loving to everyone if you're deciding to be really monogamous. So it's not surprising to me that oxytocin ended up being a more parochial um, uh, substance. But that said, it's still a really rich and interesting area of, 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 of potential research. What is oxytocin doing? How is it engaging and interacting with some of the other substances that we know are involved in reward and sort of mental well-being? Um, I'm going to do a really quick and unfair um, <laughs> uh, overview of a few studies that have looked at stress and immune functioning. So looking at blood, drawing blood, looking at saliva. On the top is a, is a study looking at blood in, and again from Steve Cole, showing that people who had a lot of interpersonal stress, and again, when I go to the literature with my little compassion goggles on, I see interpersonal stress and I go, oh, that's little compassion, right? That's, some, that's a situation where people are not having a lot of compassion and it's not a direct tie, but it's just because this research field is so new. You kind of got to pull out the pieces and start asking questions about them. Um, people who have lots of interpersonal stress, when you present them with an immune challenge, they, um, they, they show a, a, a bigger and less functional inflammatory response. Um, the other two figures are from our dear friends in the room, from Emory, who studied how doing compassion training changed immune responding and salivary cortisol, a stress response. Um, the compassion training reduced salivary cortisol and also made the immune response healthier. So um, we can look to the body to try to understand how changes in compassion or states that might be related to compassion can uh, tell us something about its relationship to health and well-being. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the vagus nerve, um, tenth cranial nerve, also affectionately known as the wandering nerve. If you remember that first figure I showed, it's got these sort of processes that go all over the body. Um, and Steve Porges sort of pioneered a theory that the vagus nerves most important purpose was to support human affiliation, right? That it was here to support things like understanding vocal intonation, uh, uh, cr producing and uh, reading sort of fa subtle facial mus musculature that tells us something about another person. Um, but he focused most on its projections to the heart because the vagus nerve exerts primary parasympathetic influence on heart rate. So your heart rate is at a certain speed, and that speed is a consequence of a tonic parasympathetic input, meaning if you didn't have this, this influence, your heart rate would be unsustainably high and you would perish, right? So the vagus nerve is always keeping things in order. Um, to the extent that that, what they call vagal tone, that sort of persistent effect is stronger in a person, that person tends to have all of these other sort of emergent benefits. They tend to be generally more positive in their emotion. They tend to have more uh, satisfying relationships. They tend to be more pro-social in their orientation towards others. So this is also a growing field. You know, what, is the, what is this parasympathetic influence on heart rate um, telling us about Compassion, well, it may be that people with elevated vagal tone are more capable of being compassionate. 
And how can you make your vagal tone stronger, right? Imagine you can go to the gym and you could do your biceps and you could get your biceps stronger every day. What can you do to make your vagal tone stronger? This picture on the left I stole from Barbara Fredrickson, who is one of the most uh, compelling thinkers in this space. And she really focuses on the relationship between vagal tone, um, sort of in, um, authentic, meaningful social connections, and happiness. Right, and has shown this has this upward spiral idea that these things work together in a way to bring you to your sort of most optimal poss possible state. Um, Margaret led us through a little practice earlier today before lunch, and she asked us to focus on our breath. And one thing she said was, "Imagine that you could have the out breath last longer than the in breath." Okay? She gave you a vagal tone exercise right there. When people ask me, how could we do this with children, and I, maybe I stole this with, from you guys, <sighs> blowing a pinwheel, right? A long, slow, outward breath would be something that would make your vagal tone stronger. Okay, I'm getting the wrap it up, so um, I'm going to stop there. I had a, a slide on the brain that I'm not going to show because I think Gael told you everything that, that, that is important to know at this phase, and if you want to know more, we can organize smaller groups, but thank you so much. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about one possible way of putting all of these brain regions and circuits and peripheral and central nervous system together to form a model of um, compassion. But I have to also underscore the point that this is one possible way to do it. And um, this guides me in my research, but is by no means the final say on how one could put a model like this together. But you'll notice I'll, I'll touch upon some of the things that, that have already been mentioned. So first I, I need to give you some background about this particular model. It actually combines insights from a variety of different disciplines. Um, so first, probably the most um, central piece of the model comes from Michael Newman's model of maternal care his neurobiological model of maternal care. So this is a model that does come from rigorous um, testing in animals where you can do things like establish cause and effect and sequence. And, um, and, and he has, in, in the studies that he's done, this model that he's put together, and it, and it really is a, it, it is a theory as well, um, because it's all the pieces aren't quite there, but he's you know, some, not much of it is speculation. But when it's been tested in other laboratories, consistently we find the same thing over and over and over again. So there's very strong support for his model. Again, it's, it's a model of maternal care um, that has been applied to parental care more generally. So, and I'm applying it in this case to caring for others in humans. The second um, piece that is used to develop this model comes from the human studies of parental responses to things like infant faces or infant cues. So there is a neuroscience of human parental responses that informs this, and some of the work that's been done on empathy as well. So the human neuroimaging work is a, is a piece of this. Um, also, a part of this is selective investment theory. This is a theory that I developed as part of my dissertation work. And what's, what this theory is, is um, it's a theory of how we engage in practices that promote the well-being of another person. It's what we do to invest in another person or pe group of people or animals. So it's broader than the concept of compassion and responding to need, per se. Um, it's talking about even what, what do you do when you don't have signs of need? What are we doing to, to, um, to, to try to help others thrive? So the two pieces of that theory that are critical um, include first that there needs to be interdependence for goals related to survival and reproduction um, in, in order to ensure a low cost of exploitation, but that once that condition is met, something else can take over, and that's the formation of a social bond. And that when the bond forms, you actually no longer need the interdependence, and that the bond itself suppresses self-interest when necessary to promote the well-being of another individual. 
Um, and what that theory suggests is that these um, <coughs> mechanisms for bonding and investing in others recruit this, this um, compassionate motivational system. So that this, this, this system that's hardwired for directing maternal care gets leveraged, really, in the case of caring for one another. And then polyvagal theory, um, which Emiliano just talked about, um, this, again, is from Stephen Porges' work on the vagal nerve and talking about how critical the sense of safety is for being able to engage this kind of um, compassionate motivational system, which you're starting to hear over and over again now is this tension between threat responding um, and the, that when you feel safe and you don't have that threat response, that the default may very well be to be compassionate. Um, the other piece comes from attachment theory, this idea that regardless of your polymorphisms for um, receptors that influence oxytocin functioning, that your history of receiving adequate care and resources as an infant will set the stage for whether you can develop a sense of safety in the world and have a, a secure base. That if you were in relationships that were predictably um, nurturing, you got what you needed, then now it's not so difficult with others to have that sort of default sense of, of, of safety. And then finally, um, this model also involves I got my degree in social psychology, so I could not look at this without the um, graduate training program in my mind as I was looking at everything. So whether we're talking about empathy, Dan Batson's work, Cialdini's work on oneness, um, the person in the situation and the importance of that interaction in determining whether or not you help, um, and then even splitting things into a perception, a motivation and then the behavior, and then moderating influences that come in to determine whether motivation is going to go one direction or another direction. That motivational conflict I've referred to before, that also goes into this model. So without further ado, I will tell you about this model, but there is a caveat. I am, in terms of a neuroscientist, some people have called me that, um, I, ha I shy away from that label because I, I, I don't usually present pictures of the brain. I, I've done my very first neuroimaging studies um, with the help of others, <laughs> not based on my own training. I read a lot about neuroscience and neurobiology. That's, that's, my, that's what I do is I, I synthesize and integrate that work, but I know very little about how to do it. So when I show you the neuroscience model, it's with the spirit of how, anybody been to London where they've got the you know, the, the train system, the metro, is you see a line that goes from this stop to this stop in your map when you're underground. And it seems very easy to follow. But in terms of mapping it onto the actual locations up, up above, there is no, no clear correspondence. So I think about the brain that way. I'm going to show you something that works for me to, to take you through the pathways and the circuits. And where in the brain that this is happening, Sometimes we're talking about regions that are too small to even show you with pixels what, what areas are, are lighting up, okay? So, um, so that's, my, that's my caveat. All right, so first of all, what you need to know about the, uh, the animal model of maternal behavior is the hypothalamus is the command center for, mater for motivation for maternal motivation. And it's not just the hypothalamus in general, it's a specific part of the, of the hypothalamus. It's the medial preoptic area, the MPOA. This is sort of like the, the holy grail of everything that gets the organism to do what it needs to do to retrieve the pups, to build the nest, to offer defense and protection. Um, if you disrupt pieces of this, one, one, thing, that, one, one thing that will happen if you damage certain parts of the MPOA, the animal will retrieve maybe one infant, but not all of them. Um, so uh, if you damage the MPOA altogether, um, there will be no maternal care. And there's very, very, very little debate about the centrality of this region in directing the motivation. And attempts to generalize have shown that this region is um, responsible for motivation um, in sheep and also in birds. Now, um, this particular system um, 
how I'm going to how I'm going to present it to you is I'm going to talk about what does a caregiving system or compassionate system need to do in order to be able to direct resources to another individual. So that's kind of how I'm going to how I'm going to present to you this um, animal model with the elaborations for humans. So the first functional requirement I think of of a system that directs help to others is that you have to be able to recognize need in others. And in the animal model, there are um, we know that cues from the amygdala actually are what trigger the MPOA, the hypothalamus. And, and, in, and you think about human studies of the amygdala, the amygdala responds to threat and distress. So it kind of makes sense that you know, you'd have to perceive distress first to, to trigger um, the motivation to help. In addition, um, we've also heard about the ACC being active when people empathize. There are a lot of studies now that suggest when parents are responding to infant cues, we're also seeing the, the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, become active. And so this idea that the ACC is tracking need in others is really compelling. Um, and in particular, there's a, there's a region that has been connected to human altruism even, that's the subgenual area of the ACC, and that'll be, seem more important later that that's where we might locate tracking need in others. The next feature, um, next requirement of the system is, is again, motivational conflict. Um, it should minimize the motivational conflict, right? It should decrease concerns about self so that you can allocate um, resources to another individual. So one part of that is suppressing reward-seeking motives. So I might, I might disagree with, with Guile's interpretation of the, the regions that are involved in, um, in empathy and compassion being related to reward. There may be parts of that, but the reward-seeking part, I'm going to argue, is inhibited and suppressed. How do you know it's not just, well, I guess I'll, I'll say right quickly at the end. Okay. So um, one of the, th the here's the here is the pathway by which the motivation, the hypothalamus triggers the actual helping behavior in the animal model. It does throw. So this is my London underground map. Um, what it does is it triggers the ventral tegmental area, which is the center for releasing dopamine, dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, this reward-seeking region, right? This this, is, this region uh, is responsible for food preferences, sex preferences, wanting, needing, chemical addiction, hoarding, um, gambling. It releases dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, which then triggers the ventral pallidum, which is our motor programs, to direct the motor program for whatever is required to provide help. But the way the nucleus accumbens, in the case of maternal care, leads to triggering these motor programs in the ventral pallidum is kind of interesting. It actually releases, the VTA releases dopamine in, to um, bind to D1 inhibitory receptors into the nucleus accumbens, as opposed to D2 excitatory receptors in the nucleus accumbens. So addiction models talk about the excitation of D2 receptors. Um, and that increased nucleus accumbens activation, the maternal care system emphasizes the excitation of the D1 receptors, which will, the, what, what, what's happening is the nucleus accumbens is inhibiting the ventral pallidum. So it has to be inhibited in order to release the ventral pallidum from inhibition. So it's a process of double inhibition that goes from taking this break that's on our motor programs, the nucleus accumbens breaking our motor program, and then boom, by inhibiting the nucleus accumbens, now we're, our motor programs can be actively engaged in helping. So again, I'm not talking about re suppressing reward altogether, because we talked about rewarding feelings associated with compassion. Um, we don't know. This is a really wide open question. One possibility is we're talking about opiate mediation of things instead of dopaminergic mediation of positive feelings. Or perhaps the dopamine that gets released is what we experience. Um, we don't know the answers to this in the subjective experience, but this is one piece, the suppressing um, reward seeking. The other piece, which will become important later, is the suppression of avoidance motivation. Um, so if we're going to, if you have an animal, like a lion that's coming at you, and you've got your baby three feet away from you, 
you know, our stress models would say, oh, fight or flight. I'm either going to kill the lion or run away. Well, that's going to be a problem then for surviving and passing on common genes if you leave your toddler. So what has to happen to, to inhibit that fight or flight system so that we can go and deal with whatever situation is necessary to help others also um, get out of harm's way? So it has to be inhibiting that system on some level. The animal model talks specifically about how the MPOA of the hypothalamus downregulates, or not downregulates, that's the wrong word, actually interrupts and interferes with the signal coming from the amygdala to the sympathetic stress response. So it is the amygdala is sending a signal to the periaqueductal gray, and the medial preoptic area is thought to kind of suppress the intermediary and the periaqueductal gray so that those signals from the amygdala can't get through. All right, so that favoring then the approach motivation um, to, to engage in motor behaviors over the withdrawal. The next piece of this model is that if you're going to give things away, it should be contingent on your ability to your resources that you have. You shouldn't be giving away when you have nothing to give. So self-efficacy um, has to be a critical feature. You've got to be able to think that, oh, I can actually come to this individual's aid. And one nice region for um, tracking learned helplessness that actually gets bigger with aversive outcomes and smaller with positive outcomes is the habenula. The habenula controls the release of dopamine and also serotonin. And so if the habenula, we feel learned helpless, is really, really active, it's going to be impossible to release dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. Um, so the MPOA projects to the abenula, are there, there are, are there densities of oxytocin receptors in the abenula? So I don't know the answer to that. I, and I don't think anybody's actually necessarily been interested in that question, so I don't know that the answer is no. Um, we, I only know about the projections between the MPOA and the habenula. So it's theoretical. Does it run inhibition on the abenula? That's what we don't know. Um, so that is, that's, a, um, th that's my hypothesis, is that it would be in inhibitory. And then should be sensitive to the potential drain on your resources or the sense of um, the idea that, that, okay, I keep giving and giving and giving and nothing is happening and I'm losing my own resources. So perhaps something like depression might interfere with activating the system. And in fact, the subgenual area of the ACC which is thought to project to the MPOA is, um, is also the target for depression, um, like, uh, like uh, the deep, 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 deep brain stimulation, right? So the idea that there is an intimate connection between depression and activating the system is at least plausible. Um, then I mentioned before, should be sensitive to cues for exploitation. One way to do this would be to kind of resist forming, except in circumstances where you recognize an interdependent partner or a bonded partner. Um, and that's where, okay, that's where what's interesting, uh, and I won't spend, I, I'll talk about this and then we'll kind of wrap things up. The orbital frontal cortex, the medial area of the orbital frontal cortex has these cells that are called bimodal cells. They integrate information from all over the body. One of the few places where sensory integration comes together. And they can switch their firing depending on differences in motivational states. So the idea that you could have cells tracking an individual, a person that you know, and change firing patterns either into the caregiving system or away from it is very plausible in this region. This region also releases or allows um, serotonin to trigger the release of oxytocin in the hypothalamus and potentially primes the medial preoptic area, making it more likely to be active in some instances and less likely if it's not the, the bonded partner. And so what I'm going to do is, instead of talking about that last part, um, about how activation could move more laterally when you're not close. Here's the final model. This is the involves social psychology that basically you can get to helping behavior in different ways, through compassion or not through compassion. 
and that this caregiving motivation comes from the cues for helping, they should be authentic, and it would lead to this MPOA regulated helping behavior, by definition would regulate your stress, it increases with closeness, relationship variables, um, interdependence, uh, individual difference factors that tell us what our vagal tone is, attachment style, sense of efficacy, increasing the chance that we'll go this route to helping behavior over the alternative, which was more extrinsic reasons to help. All right, that's Thank it. You. So in the spirit of a lab meeting, this is a talk I've never given before and with material that I only basically was learning last night. So really do want to, we're all grad students on this bus. So what I'd like to do um, is in part uh, related to a story uh, that came into my life uh, in the form of a nurse who sat next to me on the flight from Oakland to Phoenix who had worked in a hospital for many years and transitioned to now be a home health care provider. And she was going on vacation because she actually was now suffering empathic distress in the hospital when she had very specific tasks. And we've talked about this with physicians. She really was able to do her specific jobs, be kind to patients, but she was not overwhelmed by their suffering. Now she's the only person who enters homes, delivers health care, and sees in their environment so much information related to the reality in multiple dimensions of their suffering, including their lifestyle that led up to it and the changes that their illnesses have provoked. So what I want to do is talk briefly about aspects of empathic responding that we really haven't quite touched upon to date, even though we've been mentioning it over and over again. And that is aspects of sensation and perception that may be modified by your empathic response and, in fact, modified in an ongoing way by your dynamical enmeshment in the relationships with individuals and things around you. So there was a really wonderful article by a colleague of uh, Joel's, Asif uh, Gansfahar, um, in uh, Trends and Cognitive uh, sciences uh, last year, and it's about. Hmm? We did a journal club on this. You did a journal club on this. So this is called brain-to-brain -brain coupling, and the cadence of my voice is actually causing modifications of the ongoing oscillatory activity of each of your brains. And if I were to turn around, even if I raise my voice, you are missing the multisensory communication that my lips provide, and so your sense of being with me just decreased when I turned around. And if I gesture, I'm actually causing further changes in the way that your neural activity is actually tuned to perceive the content of what's coming from me in real time. So, this is going to be from this paper. Cognition materializes in an interpersonal space. The emergence of complex behaviors requires the coordination of actions among individuals according to a shared set of rules. Right now, you're kind of nodding, listening to me. We have, uh, we're participating in a form of the social contract. Despite the central role of other individuals in shaping one's mind, most cognitive studies focus on processes that occur within a single individual. We call for a shift from single brain to multi-brain frame of reference. We argue that in many cases the neural processes in one brain are coupled to the neural processes in another brain via the transmission of a signal through the environment. Brain-to-brain -brain coupling constrains and shapes the actions of each individual in a social network leading to complex joint behaviors that could not have emerged otherwise. There's actually a recent study that I won't um, go into in detail that looks at uh, speech uh, comprehension and synchronization between uh, an individual and a computer versus two individuals. And when two individuals are doing this together, 
their uh, speech perception uh, improves in a way that is above and beyond synchronizing uh, with a machine. So variance that we provide to, an to a circumstance becomes informationally relevant. So this is a, an idea of what this is uh, about. This has to do with speech rhythms in the brain uh, uh, entrained to, with a certain amplitude uh, in a hearer who simply is maybe listening to a loudspeaker. Here there's a person who um, is talking this is ongoing and there's actually not auditory input. Here you're hearing speech but you're not seeing the lips because the person's behind you. Now you see them and this oscillatory activity that is relating to your instantaneous state of attention and perception is enf enhanced by the coordinated behavior of the act of communication. Here's a study where you could actually imagine uh, using Granger causality. This is uh, a technique that won the Nobel Prize in economics for how one market trend will predict another. It's used in neurophysiology. You can look and see what activity in a brain of a person who's gesturing, how that accounts for increases uh, in the uh, activity of a listener. So that's simply to say, when we say we're all connected, this isn't a metaphor. And it's not a theoretical construct that, you know, what I you know, the pile of crap I leave behind, you have to walk through. That's not what I mean. <laughs> That's not as elegant as medley and whatever. <laughs> so here's a study of four saxophonists, all simultaneously hooked up. This is out of Italy, Bob Leone's group. And uh, this is actually a w wonderful use of Photoshop. Um, but they actually have a large uh, amplifier setup where they can simultaneously hyperscan people with EEG simultaneously, and they're playing a quartet, which is then a videotape. And what they do is they analyze each person's EEG when they're playing and when observing the group playback. And um, they use uh, Baron Cohen's empathy quotient. These are just some of the items. A number of these... Um, I, I definitely felt um, that I am not such a paragon of empathy. People <coughs> often tell me that I went too far in driving my point home in the discussion. <laughs> Somehow I... <laughs> um, Self-awareness. Yeah, well, I can't always see why someone should have been offended. Uh, these are things that have nothing to do with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> anyway, this empathy quotient, they did a, a very interesting forward solution of... Um, oscillatory activity in the alpha brain uh, region, uh, frequency region between 8 and 12 hertz, and they uh, use what's called S. Loretta, which is uh, a computational method of analyzing this. And they found a significant decrease <coughs> in um, alpha activity, and we interpret decreases in alpha activity as increases in cortical activation. They found a significant correlation at the, basically at the Bonferroni corrected level between your empathy quotient when you're watching the performance and the degree of baseline to observation suppression in alpha activity. The more empathic the musicians were, the more observing the performance decreased uh, this uh, neural parameter. Something about the activation, this may be related to activation of the mirror neuron system. We don't know the exact neural substrates. One of the problems, we often reject papers that use Loretta techniques because they're assuming your brain is equal to the Montreal Neurological uh, Standard Brain. It's very low resolution. Nonetheless, this is a highly significant relationship between a empathic quotient score and the degree of a neural marker. This is uh, really another paper that is a recent somatosensory activity is modulated during observation of others' pain and touch. So we've been talking about the pain network. We've been talking about empathic responses, but this is a modification. You see a set of Images, these are actually six-second videos where you see a needle penetrate a model's hand. 
in different locations so you don't habituate to the same thing. They actually were clever enough to change whatever fluid is in the needle so you're getting, <laughs> they're changing so it's not, you can't habituate and just say I'm not going to see this because I know exactly what it is because it changes a little bit each time. So what you have is you have somebody with getting their hand uh, penetrated by a needle, somebody stroked by a Q-tip, or just a plain hand. Now what's interesting is this is what you're watching and you're told to take this egocentric, imagine you're the person, not allocentric yourself. But they're taking your hand and they have a pneumatic stimulator on your finger. And they're giving you six, uh, one per second time, little air puffs to your, uh, the, your finger. And you're going to get a somatosensory event-related potential to the air puffs. And they're going to ask, how much is the brain response to a simple sensory stimulus modulated by your vision visualization of the pain and touch? So this is what they get. They're looking at very early components of the somatosensory response. It's to the right hand, which means it contralaterally organized, so it's over the left hemisphere. And um, at baseline, there is um, limited activity. Uh, it's a weak somatosensory response. This is, this is to the air puff. So this is identical physical stimuli when there's no picture, a picture of a hand, a picture of the hand being stroked with a Q-tip or penetrated with a needle. When you just see the hand, you just get this small somatosensory response. When you see touching, when you see just stroking of the hand, you have a marked increase, and this is a significant increase. This is uh, significant for both uh, this early and then this slightly later response. And they only analyzed a subset of electrodes, but I think that if you look at the pattern here, if they used other, uh, somewhat more sophisticated ways of analyzing all of the spatiotemporal information, you would find significant differences between touch and pain. But one very important take-home message is that just witnessing a gesture of touch on another person in a video is actually modulating your somatosensory system. Your basic, the impact of encountering the physical environment on your brain has been modulated by witnessing and touching. This is uh, two other things. Significant correlations were observed between scores from the perspective taking subscale of the interpersonal reactivity <coughs> index and this P50 amplitude. This is a 0.5 R squared. And at, in, this was in central parietal and parietal R squared 0.6 scores from the perspective taking subscale were also correlated with P5 amplitudes on the touch condition. So this is this is the pain condition and the touch condition. Though the interrelationship between uh, perspective taking was stronger for the pain condition. So individual psychological differences are interacting with the degree to which your brain response to simple sensory stimuli is modulated. Did they look at responses without the puffs? There is no, there is, there is only responses to puffs because it's an ERP experiment. They're not looking at modulatory changes in the ongoing EEG, say to laterality changes or whatever, just to the impact of the film. Okay. No, that film is, uh, is just going on in the background. Here's another interesting um, related observation. I am touched by your pain, limb-specific modulation of the cortical response to tactile stimulation. So I was telling you before, the average brain response to a simple once per second tap. That gives you an event-related potential that you can pull out with signal averaging. There's another evoke potential technique called the steady state evoke potential. In this case, you have a little device, a membrane on the uh, hand which is going to be vibrating at 25 cycles per second. And you can look in the EEG for an activity at that frequency range and you're looking at how this ongoing oscillatory input is changing power in that frequency band of the EEG. And here 
there's a variant of the same density uh, stimulus set that um, uh, Gael was showing us, where you actually have images relating to a hand in pain situation, a hand in a neutral situation. Um, I don't want to think about this, um, and here, and nor this, uh, nor this. <laughs> But here's getting out of a car and like going to open your door. So they actually are manipulating which limb is going to get smushed or bashed or whatever. And this is a, a complicated slide. So, um, and, and yes, I'm going to be guilty of a little geeky thing here. Yes. Well, I was curious, the pictures, what's your opinion if those uh, pictures represent limbs from different ethnicities and people watch them, why do you think people like this spot? So that's actually a really interesting question and in the particular experiment that I'm talking about, they blurred the dis the, the um, these are from the density paper in this experiment, they blurred elements of the limbs so you couldn't tell the age or ethnicity uh, of the, the limb. It was, a, it was an attempt at a kind of cross-cultural, cross-pan-agic uh, to, if such a word exists. Um, but it's a great and very important question because in-group, out-group, empathy studies exist. So um, this is basically a map of the oscillatory activity in a baseline condition. What? How, how many? One minute? All right. So, all right. so what they find is that they're, rec they're stimulating your hand, and when you see images of the hand, you actually have more perturbation in your uh, event-related response, your steady state evoked potential. So what it really means is that your uh, body image is being morphed by the actual physical location of the pain of the person you're encountering. So extremely briefly, this is too cool an experiment not to talk about. <laughs> And um, so this is first-person experience of body transfer in virtual reality. So you get it, put on the goggles, you're in a cave, you're in a room where you can walk around, and as you walk around, you will see what you would see if you were in this virtual environment. This study was only done on males. What happens is that you explore for two minutes this virtual environment, and then either you're going to uh, be swapped to a first-person perspective and you're going to be told to sit down, or you're going to have a third-person perspective. So if you have the first-person perspective and you look down, you see that you are wearing a plaid skirt and you have the girl, the arms of a girl. And if you look up to the right, you will see this woman uh, near you. And uh, a little later, her, she's going to raise her hand. That's an important moment. You can also have a third-person perspective, so that you're seeing uh, this girl, That's this is her face, and when you look out, now you see uh, the arm of this person. Now, both people, whether they have a first-person or third-person perspective, are pulled up to a kind of a God's eye view at the ceiling. And what they're going to watch is the completion of that woman slap the girl in whoa do you see now do you just this is virtual reality guys and you're going whoa <laughs> so talk about empathy this is like hypothetical virtual empathy for virtual reality <laughs> so you are way too compassionate so what happens the people the men who had the first person perspective this is heart rate deceleration upon watching the slap from the third person perspective, their heart rate, they get, oh, you know, they have this huge cardiac response. That, and they report subjectively fear. That was not in the person, in the third person perspective. A bunch of guys actually experiencing somatically that they took on the body of a woman in a virtual reality experiment. <laughs> That's my summary. <laughs>